Catholic tradition of our faith, this wisdom tradition that comes to us from the generations of the Hebrew tradition. And it picked up by the early Christian community represented in our Gospel of Mark. And continue to help us look at Jesus and his teachings in light of this wisdom tradition. Now, firstly, in the Proverbs, which is a part of this older tradition that comes to us, the way that wisdom is depicted as this woman figure, well, first of all, in the nouns that we refer to wisdom, those are all nouns that have feminine endings to them, so it's not unusual at all in the historical culture we inherit here to have uh, wisdom and all kinds of values that in Greek have feminine endings. You know, charity, hope, faith, all have feminine endings. They're all depicted in art as being women. Well, here we have wisdom, Sophia, depicted as a woman. And she, you know, in, is embodied. She is walking around in the marketplace. Wisdom is where people interact. It's where relationships happen. Wisdom is there in the midst of humanity, where humanity is uh, kind of struggling away to have relationships with one another and with God. And wisdom is making this appeal. You know, come and love me. <laughs> want me. <laughs> I want you. Come and have a relationship with me. Want knowledge because knowledge is offered to you by God as a way to have a relationship with one another in a way that brings life to the world, in a way that it incarnates compassion and love and makes life worth living and livable for everyone and all the life. That's the appeal, the call, the seduction, please love me, love God. Then we have this recognition that the word of wisdom, the word of God, the knowledge of God, becomes very important for not speaking well, not introducing our words well into the world can have a very negative impact, can be as destructive to life and relationships as it is when we use the Word of God in its creative capacity, in its healing and restorative capacity, in its relational and reconciling capacity. The Word then becomes very important, and I love that image of the tongue as being this little tiny rudder on a big ship. And you have to start turning that rudder pretty darn early in a conversation <laughs> to get the ship to bottle. <coughs> yeah? This is what we have in the Titanic, exact situation, with the line rudder for a very big ship. And it goes right for that iceberg before it's realized. And so, if we're mindful of the power of the word to either be destructive or to bring healing, it's wisdom that asks us to always try to approach even the most challenging interaction with a commitment to set some self stuff aside a little bit for a greater good. Not to say or deny our passion, or even if we're angry, but ask ourselves why. Kind of keep that a little bit so that we can hear and open up what the other person needs to say. Because we know what happens when anger and violence, when a desire or fear not to hear, and not to have a conversation, can shut it down. It shuts down the very quality of relationship, of authenticity, of mutual vulnerability that we are called to have with one another. So that the kingdom can be experienced with greater understanding, a greater self-worth, a 
of greater valuation than the other. And the validation that we have different experiences and wisdom to bring to the world. This week, this past week, I don't know about you, but it's been a hard one. Every time turning on the news, Tuesday on Monday, with the death of Christopher Stevens at the embassy in the U. And the death subsequent to him. Violence. And what makes it more painful is that this conversation in common violence in so many ways, whether it's that physical, actual violence, or whether it's a violence to the human spirit, a violence to emotion, a violence to our, our mental health, our corporate health. It's been particularly hard when this violence is couching itself as being in the name of God. From many faith traditions, whether it's Coptic Christian or other kinds of Christian or Islam, when Jesus asked the question to his disciples, who do you say I am? What do you think God is? What's your image? Because what we say God is can make or break our world in very real ways. When he asked the question, what do others say I am? And in his time, the people of his own faith, the Hebrew faith, are asking that question. And they're trying very hard using the categories of experience that they historically and culturally already have. They have experiences of beloved and valued prophets that challenge the status quo, that challenge oppressive and dominating forces. They have that. And they see that in much of what Jesus is doing. They have Elijah, who calls for a, literally a whole new world, a whole new way of relating that turns the world upside down. And they see Jesus doing that. Not always especially peaceful, <laughs> but a very, very important in our spiritual rigor. And then they experience him in this way of a king, somehow a leader. And they keep, in fact, trying to make him king. But in an image and experience is sort of like King David, someone who quite literally brings violence to conquer other nations in the name of God and justifying them. But then when Jesus asks them, who do you say I am? And Peter responds with the Messiah. They have this idea in their brain of all of these kinds of things. A king, a savior, that very much looks like a conqueror. Very much looks like saying that there are only one way of thinking and experience and being in faith or relationship with God. Only one. And if we say that, if any faith tradition says that, what happens to everybody else who has a different experience? There's no place for you. There's no place for them. And Jesus comes and says, that is not the kind of Messiah I am, or will ever be. That is not what I embody as the incarnate wisdom of God. That is not what God has purpose for, for his people and for humanity and for life in his created world. It is not. And when he says, get behind me, Satan, to not value and seek our own Our own need to feel validated in what we think and say. To set those aspects aside so that we can hear others. So that together we can discover our common ground. What transcends all of these outward appearances. If each faith 
or philosophy or discipline or perspective says ultimately that we are about what is life bringing and compassionate and loving and ultimately caring and kindness. If we are about that, let us do that. Let us actually do that. Because anything else brings humanity to its peril. We see that communication in all its forms, the word in all its forms, can today with technology spread like fire. It can be incendiary. And we saw that through the impact of YouTube and email this past week. We saw it in the impact of television in our home. My concern becomes if what remains newsworthy is what is most extreme and frankly not representative of any core faith that I have ever seen in any true faith or culture. Then if we, who may have a different voice, a piece of wisdom to offer into a realm of violence, if we do not garner courage to set our fear aside and enter that conversation, Violence will be the only voice that is heard. We must bring up. In Christ's 